Little Henry Molaison was repeating to himself a funny little counting rhyme he had learned just the night before. He was a bright child of seven, and he liked to sink into his thoughts and memories. He stumbled over a word. He closed his eyes for a second to remember it. At that moment, a cyclist came around the corner, apparently in a hurry, so he did not see the boy in front of him. One blow changed everything. For the following years, Henry suffered from endless and painful epileptic seizures until something worse happened. Dr. William Scoville had no other choice. By then, Ben was a grown man on massive doses of anti-epileptic drugs that weren't helping much anymore. The poor guy couldn't work or live at all. The doctor was worried that the amount of medication he was taking would at some point become fatal. And in general, it was hard to watch the young guy suffer. Any person would have wanted to relieve Henry's suffering. Scoville decided on desperate steps. He figured out which parts of the brain might be responsible for the epilepsy and took up the surgical instruments. A few light hand movements and two more holes in Henry's skull appeared above his eyes. Using a spatula, the doctor reached deep into the boy's brain and, using a silver straw, blew a piece of brain the size of a child's fist out of his skull. Finishing the surgery, Scoville believed that Henry would finally live a full life. The seizures had not disappeared completely, but their frequency and severity had noticeably diminished. Scoville was ready to celebrate the success, but he found something strange in Henry's behavior. The boy in the hospital constantly forgot where the bathroom door was located. And the events of the day before, he could not remember at all. The doctor thought it was very strange. Could it be that he damaged the boy's intellect? It couldn't be. He acted very carefully and tried not to hit the areas of the brain that are responsible for the intellect. But it was worth checking anyways. Scoville ran several mental tests and they were all in order. Henry's personality was not affected by the operation either. He could tell all about his past life and his old home. However, the boy could hardly remember the building where his parents had moved 10 months before the operation. The magazine lying in the room on the table. Henry reviewed it daily, not even knowing that he had read it the day before. Each time, he laughed at the same joke and was amazed anew at the incident that he had heard about the day before. The boy had permanently lost the ability to retain new memories. He could tell incidents from his former life, but he recorded nothing of current events. His so-called working memory was preserved. That is, he could hold certain information in his head while he solved some task. Usually this lasts about 60 seconds, and after that, all the information he received is sent to the memory vault. But this is in healthy people. In two minutes, Henry's memory was gone from everything he did during that time. The guy had nothing to do but learn to live with these peculiarities. Although any learning in such a state is almost impossible. Molison got a job near Hartford, the town where he was born in 1926. He was hired at a special center where people with disabilities work. One of Henry's tasks was to pack several balloons in a box. He had to stop whenever he reached a certain number, only he always forgot exactly how many balloons to put in each box. Sometimes he would be sent to the warehouse to bring a certain tool. Once there, Henry was immediately lost. He would look around and try to figure out why he had come here in the first place. And so, every time, confusion and despair became his constant companions. Subsequently, the people who worked with Henry would give him a picture of the object he needed to bring from the warehouse. If the guy didn't lose the picture on the way, he would guess his task by looking at it. Without more notes, Henry couldn't stick to personal hygiene. He couldn't remember if he brushed his teeth or if he should brush them at all. When you can't navigate your surroundings, bad breath is the least of your worries. Henry's caretaker hung notes, reminding him to raise and lower the toilet seat. The guy performed all the actions written on the paper, and then they faded from memory. This case is much more complicated and dangerous than the one shown in Christopher Nolan's Memento. Leonard Shelby, the main character, remembered everything during the day, went to bed at night, and by morning, he forgot the events of the previous day, and everything had to start over. Mollison's case is Leonard Shelby's entire day, compressed into two minutes. When Henry felt hungry, he forgot about it, holding a piece of bread in his hands. When he was full, the information about it disappeared, and the guy sat down to eat again. The hardest part for Henry was when his father died. Each time he learned of what had happened as if it was the first time. Again and again, he felt the shock and grief of the loss, 
as strongly as when it had first happened. To keep it in mind, the boy kept a note in his wallet stating that his father had long since died and his mother lived in a nursing home. So for the rest of his life, he never knew for sure whether his parents were alive or not. However, he still remembered some things. Henry knew that such things as contact lenses existed, even though they appeared after his brain surgery, as well as the fact that there was a person named Yoko Ono. True, Henry always forgot who it was. Perhaps his memory worked even better than the doctors thought. One experiment demonstrated this beautifully. We won't go into detail, but during the experience, Henry thought he was doing the task for the first time, every time, and he was getting better and better at it. This meant that some part of his mind was still remembering current events and helping him learn new skills. Thus, Henry Mollison made an invaluable contribution to science. Thanks to him, scientists learned that memory is located in the hippocampus, the part of the brain that Dr. Scoville removed during surgery in 1953, and for motor activity, therefore, are responsible in other departments. Incapable of performing many everyday activities, Henry helped scientists make a career out of his name. This is especially true of Susan Corkin, who spent 46 years of her life working with a forgetful patient. From 1966 to 2000, Henry visited her lab 55 times. During that time, they became incredibly close. Susan and her colleagues became a real family for Henry, who had by then lost both his parents. Other researchers lined up to conduct the experiment with him. Experiments with such a rare exhibit promised success to any neurobiologist. However, Susan let very few people near her ward. She was very reverent about Henry, and the main thing for her was his well-being, not the vanity of her colleagues. She allowed the experiment only when she was sure it would not harm the boy in any way. As time passed, Henry began to age, but he didn't realize it himself. One morning, while in the hospital, the boy went to the mirror. He immediately recognized himself, but noticed a change in his appearance. Those creases on his face had never been there before, and for some reason, his hair had a white tint. A nurse entered the room and found Henry studying his reflection in amazement. She asked the boy what he thought of his appearance. He replied that he probably wasn't a boy anymore. By then, not a boy was over 50. Dr. Corkin herself tried to find out the age of the man who was constantly living in the moment. Henry confidently answered that he was about 30 years old. When Corkin showed him the mirror, he added a dozen years to himself, although he was already much older. Henry had never thought about death either, and why would he think about it if he couldn't remember what happened a few minutes before? But the fact that other people had memories was very disturbing. Well, how disturbing? It occupied his thoughts for two minutes at most. Henry never knew if he was familiar with the person next to him. Mollison had developed the habit of being friendly to everyone he met. What if it was an old acquaintance? But the only real friend for Henry remained Dr. Corkin. When the guy was admitted to the hospital, he listed her as the person to contact in case of emergency. Even after his death, Henry did not want to part with the kind and caring Susan. He bequeathed his brain to her. When Henry Mollison passed away in 2008, Dr. Corkin extracted this very valuable organ for science. Later, the contents of the forgetful patient's skull became world famous. Dr. Corkin dissected the brain in a live broadcast, which was watched by many viewers. This video is now available on the website of the University of California, San Diego. Until his death, Henry kept only those memories that were formed before the operation. In his place, his later life was remembered by others. Dozens of scientists have documented Henry's actions and words during the experiments. Several theatrical plays have been produced about his life, and many scholarly works have been written. So, despite his own forgetfulness, he will be remembered more than many of us. Henry Mollison is the most famous case of andrograde amnesia, but it is by no means the only one, and other people have earned the disease in simpler ways, without surgical intervention. Christine Young Oakley, 33, was getting ready to celebrate the new year. The tree was already dressed up and gifts for family and friends were prepared. A stroke ruined Christine's New Year's mood, as well as her short-term memory. But that didn't stop her from writing a book about her very difficult condition. A memoir titled, Tell Me Everything You Don't Remember, The Stroke That Changed My Life, 
was born out of Christina's partial rehabilitation. Immediately after the stroke, she not only forgot all of her current events, but also was unable to relate all of her past memories. If you know of other similar cases, share them in the comments below this video.